ABCs of Anesthesia podcast. My name's Kas. And I'm Lahiri. Hi. And uh, in this episode, we're going to continue on from the series we started last week, which is really looking at uh, the common drugs we lose, use in anesthesia. And this week, we're going to talk about opiates. Um, so we'll cue the music and we'll get started. Okay, so let's get started. Now, so today's episode, opioids, and you know the way we were thinking about this whole series of podcasts, again, is to give you really practical stuff that you could just listen on your way to work in your first couple of weeks of anesthesia. So you've got something that's practical and you can use. And today's topic is opioids. Um, and so really the way you think about opioids, the reason we need opioids in anesthesia is really for induction intraoperatively for the rest of the operation and then post-operative management. Um, and so we, we thought we'd structure, by, structure it by going through all the different regularly used opioids uh, that are mo the most effective ones. So we'll, we'll go through morphine, fentanyl, alfentanyl, remifentanyl, as well as IV oxycodone. And so in this episode, we're not going to go through tramadol or ketamine. We'll go through those in, in other episodes where we might explore, you know, induction agents or multimodal analgesia. Uh, so hopefully we'll get you lots of really practical advice. We'll go through, you know, the doses, the onset, the duration and offset, and why you would use something or the special features that make the drug special or you know, really, really effective and things to watch out for or the boring side effects. So that's our structure. We'll get cracking with all of that. Fantastic. So I guess to add on to that, you know, really what, we, what we're trying to do with this podcast is um, give you something, a framework and a foundation to build on your knowledge in anesthesia. Um, this is not you know, targeted at a part two level or even a part one level. Um, and, and, you know, that knowledge will come as you progress through your training and you do anesthesia, but this is really on your first week, you know, you don't want to, knowing the PKA of something isn't going to help you. What's going to help you is having a framework for when to use these opiates, which is the most suitable agents and what are their relevant adverse effects and their special features, um, which will allow you to do your job. Yeah, you'll find that a lot of anesthesia, especially when you're starting out, your consultants, even at a junior level, they'll want you to make decisions and just know that there's probably no absolute right decision. Many consultants will vary on what choice of agent they'll use, but your ability to make a decision and know the problems and sort out those problems is what makes you sound pretty good and make you know, good decisions for your patients. So yeah, we might as well get cracking. Um, just, just to give it a bit of a overall, um, for induction, what's the whole point of giving opioids for induction, Cass? Like, why do you give opioids for induction? I guess the, the principles of giving an opiate or any analgesic for induction is really to blunt the sympathetic response to, to laryngoscopy or to the insertion of the LMA. So, so these are, you know, very sensitive tissues, um, your larynx and your pharynx, which isn't used to having uh, metal yeah. blades shoved into <laughs> them very often at all. Um, and, and you do have quite a, quite a um, profound nociceptive um, sympathetic um, response to these stimuli. So uh, there's lots of cases you want to prevent that to reduce pain. And there's incidents where you want to reduce that sympathetic surge. So that is a predominant reason mm. I would think you want to use these, these drugs. And so do you care um, in, in, in a young patient, do you care that the patient becomes tachycardic on intubation? Honestly, probably not. Um, it probably <laughs> does, it doesn't, it just probably doesn't really matter. It, um, it, doesn't look as nice it doesn't feel as nice um i think uh, you know as we said there's, there's lots of things you can do in anesthesia there's lots of things you don't have to do in anesthesia and still get a patient across safely but then there's ways to make the journey nicer and safer for the patient yeah and so i, I almost say it's, it's funny that i think we give opioids for everyone as a matter of routine a lot of the time like i had one consultant who just said why are you giving fentanyl do you care that this 20 year old becomes tachycardic just give morphine you know you don't need to get these two agents and I, I did find that a bit confronting because, you know, the, the, the patient becomes tachycardic and it just doesn't look good. And, uh, and if you're not familiar with that whole thing, it just feels like you've given an average anesthetic. That said, if someone is, you know, you really want to avoid tachycardia, they've got some level of aortic stenosis or ischemic heart disease, you know, then I really would care about the opioids I give. Um, but the other thing is sometimes like this is kind of the art of anesthesia where, in a young patient, I might give 100 of fentanyl. I know that that's not going to be totally analgesic for laryngoscopy, and I probably haven't given it, given it soon enough. And that's okay, because sometimes in these patients, when the blood pressure drops after induction, let's say you've given the induction drugs, the first blood pressure is you know, 150 in this 40-year-old patient, and then the next one drops to 70 as you're bag masking, waiting for the relaxing to work. Sometimes you want to use that laryng laryngoscope 
uh, to get the blood pressure up instead of using your vasopressor, your metaraminol. So I will intentionally go, okay, you know, hey, the, the blood pressure is a bit low. I'm just going to intubate now with satisfactory conditions and put, put that laryngoscope in, cause a bit of pain, not too much, get the blood pressure up, and then I don't have to use anything. That's kind of the art of the system of anesthesia. Hey, have you done that before, Cass? Because I haven't planned to do it, but often, you know, when you do have an unwell septic emergency case, um, who does drop their bundle, um, so to speak, on induction. It, it can be a very useful tool. It's also kind of like waiting for the surgical incision at the start mm. of a case. Um, those are kind of very natural points at which you do get an increase in your blood pressure and your heart rate. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, I think great anesthetists predict them and then plan for them and um, use them to use them to kind of tailor their anesthetic because ideally giving the less anesthetic as possible is in, yeah. some, in some ways the better, best. Absolutely. And so then going on to so induction, you obviously need the mainly the sympathetic response to laryngoscopy and intubation. Afterwards, intraoperative and postoperatively, you give analgesia just because that's just the right thing to do. You don't want your patients to have severe pain intraoperatively or postoperatively. And you know, there's evidence that shows that severe pain uh, postoperatively has a you know is a predictor for persistent postoperative pain, you know, in the future at six months or so. Um, so you really want to just give the right analgesic multimodal analgesia and opioids and strong opioids uh, just to make sure that that doesn't occur and your patient wakes up pretty happy. So that said, let's, let's go into these agents. So using that format, we're going to go through morphine, fentanyl, alfentanyl, remifentanyl, and IV oxycodone. And we're going to do the dose, onset, rough duration approximately, uh, as well as why would you use it and what do you, what do you need to look out for? So morphine, what do you reckon, Kaz? Yeah, so um, you know, morphine. I I would predominantly use it for intraoperative and postoperative use um, mm. when it is required. So morphine is a um, kind of a medium um, to longer acting um, acting agent. So it's really useful intraoperatively to um, to control the pain, um, the, the normal intraoperative pain, and it also sets up a good level of um, long acting analgesia for both postoperative coverage as well. I uh, can't say I've ever used morphine um, as in pre uh, for induction um, to reduce the, <laughs> the stimulation to, to laryngoscopy, but theoretically, if you have an intubate, if you have a you know patient who's already asleep and um, over sedation isn't an issue, if you give a big dose early on enough, uh, it, it would definitely have that effect. So yeah, I mean the dose is roughly you know 0 0.1 milligrams per kilogram. I, you know it's it, the answer is always a vial <laughs> for many <Yeah>. things. <laughs> the answer is not a vial for metaraminol. <laughs> That's yes. definitely not the answer, but so morphine, you know, you give roughly for most lap collies, let's say as a standard, you'll give 10 milligrams throughout the whole case. Uh, I remember with the liver cases, the big long cases, lots of pain, you might even have 20 of morphine uh, mm -hmm. as the, as the main agent after that. Um, it's peak onset, it's roughly about 15 to 30 minutes, but you definitely see its effects in five minutes. Um, and as you give more, you know, the, the, on, the, the, long, the longevity, the duration might, might be a bit longer as well. Um, what would you watch out for, Kaz, with morphine? Yeah, so uh, with morphine, um, I guess the, the main thing with that class is uh, histamine release um, due to muscle degranulation. So hmm. um, you can have quite profound um, histamine release with morphine. And have you seen that? Um, not intraoperatively, to be honest. I mean, I, I have seen the postoperative itch predominantly with um, yeah. <laughs> or morphine, but um, yeah, I haven't seen a kind oh. of big so, drop or anything. Have you? Yeah, I've seen cases where like the consultant has asked the reg to give 20 of morphine at the end of a case and they've given it straight down the central line, flushed it, and the blood pressure dropped to half what it used to be. And yeah, well, so I've, 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 I've seen cases like that, you know, cases like this, you know, occur. And really it's one of those things, if you're going to give a big dose of morphine, you, you give it slowly. You don't want to see that, especially in a crumbly, ill patient. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, but also it, it does have act, like a lot of opioids do have active metabolites, but I think the active metabolites of morphine are most well known. So, you know, you get your hmm. morphine three glucuronide and morphine six glucuronide, and, you know, this is excreted by the kidney, but it's also active. And so in renal failure, back in the old days, they used to just dose it at smaller doses, you know, smaller, less frequent dosing. And that would prevent kind of a lot of these problems of, you know, hyperalgesia as well as super, you know, potent analgesia and the seizure effects that can happen with this. Uh, but yeah, you know, you can use other agents that don't accumulate and don't have active metabolites. So I'd watch out for that histamine release, big doses rapidly, 
um, as well as any kind of organ dependent, uh, sorry, any, any kind of organ impairment, meaning that the metabolites would accumulate. Exactly. Yeah. Actually, on that, as, as a framework for someone new to these drugs, would you, would you recommend kind of, if, if you're doing a lab collie, for example, mm. something that's of, you know, mild to moderate, from moderate pain, would you say, would, how would you tell a new resident mm. to determine whether they should bolus two milligrams every 20 minutes versus just giving five plus five at two different time points that are spread apart? How, how would you, is there a science to that? I, I don't think there's a science. Most, most people would give fentanyl or an, alfentanyl at induction. And that's just the standard that most people do. And then after that, interoperatively, most people would use more fentanyl or morphine. And you know what I've seen, I, I generally just give five after induction and that builds up slowly as the fentanyl wears off. And then nearing the end, of, the end of the case, I give another five. Uh, but you know, I've, I've, I just don't think it matters too much. You'll get a feel for it. I wouldn't stress about that. Mm. Yeah, exactly. So I think I think the principle here basically is that, you know, you because because with these long acting drugs, it's, it's a bit more difficult to titrate to effect with fentanyl, you know, you have a quick onset, relatively short onset um, duration. So you can kind of titrate to heart rate or, or to keep near but I guess with morphine, it's much more about getting it in, getting a decent dose and keeping them comfortable. You can always top it up as you need to, but it's, it's, it's less of that active process as you would with fentanyl, for example. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so let's get on to fentanyl. So fentanyl is probably the most commonly used drug in our hospital in our practice. Onset's pretty quick. You know, you see effects very soon and even in one minute, but the peak effects probably five minutes. Uh, and it roughly lasts 30 minutes when you're giving small doses that redistribute very rapidly. It's very lipid soluble, redistribute rapidly. So the offset is not due to metabolism. You know, it's due to the fact that it goes into your other tissues and gets out of that central compartment. So that's the onset. The duration will increase the more you give it, uh, just because it's got a pretty long half-life, half, longer half-life than morphine. So, you know, if you're running infusions of this or running PCAs over long periods, we're not sure how much will saturate your tissues but you have to be careful. So the offset might be a lot quicker than half an hour over days. Now, what would make you, what are the special features? What would make you use more uh, fentanyl, Kaz? Yeah, um, so fent fentanyl's benefit, as you said, is it's, short, it's quick acting, short acting, um, very titratable. Um, so we, you know, we would use fentanyl predominantly um, kind of for, as an induction agent to limit the sympathetic response to laryngoscopy or LMA insertion, as mm. well as intraoperatively. Um, it's got relatively less um, of the side effects of morphine. So, um, you know, it's, it's hepatically met metabolized. There's no real significant active metabolites. So it's relatively safe in renal failure. Um, and you don't really have the histamine release um, or any of those adverse effects. Um, mm. And it's really cheap, I think, as well. Yeah, so, that's um, right. It's ubiquitously available. Um, you don't have to worry about the price, fortunately, when you're training. Uh, something, yeah. something later. And, and you'll, you'll see, more, you know, fentanyl is used for everything, right? Generally speaking, you'll give, you know, one mic per kilo, but you, you know, you just usually round up. So most patients get about a hundred mics, but if you really want to give a cardio stable induction, so you'll hear this term cardio stable patients with bad ischemic heart disease, bad aortic stenosis, where you really don't want to tachycardia, you may be giving massive doses. So you know, even, even anywhere from three to five to 10 mics per kilo, of fentanyl. And you'll really see this in the cardiothoracic anesthesia kind of sector. So if you're doing CAGs in patients with really tight lesions, tight coronary arteries, you may give like, you know, if you like, ho hopefully you see this when, once you start doing anesthetics, you'll get in there, you might give 50 of fentanyl, even hundred while you're putting the drips and the art lines in. And then for induction, you'll start a slow trickle of propofol and give, you know, another 200 and then even another 100. So you, you might even have 300 to 500 micrograms just for the induction. And I think it's, it, it's very effective, but it's also very cardio stable because it doesn't have the histamine release and it doesn't you know, rise super quickly. It's not like remifentanyl, alfentanyl, where it just hits the patient straight up, causes bradycardia. It, it, I think the fact that it's effective, but you know, rises slowly means that the patient doesn't suddenly become bradycardic or you know, have any of these, you know, bigger problems. So it'd be used so commonly, like Kaz said, for almost anything, and you can give massive doses to people. It's cardiostable, often for those bad, bad sick hearts you'd give this for. Mm. Uh, what, what would you watch out for then with fentanyl? Um, so I guess one of the logistical things uh, in terms of pharmacokinetics, I think is giving it 
um, mm. at an appropriate time. So I think giving it early enough before laryngoscopy that actually has effect, which um, I think is quite difficult to do logistically and also mm. when you're a junior trainee doing these cases alone. Um, I still mm. find I kind of forget. Um, in, in terms of, I guess, um, other adverse effects, so, so giving um, big doses, doses intraoperatively can cause saturation of the peripheral compartments, which then can cause the drug to move back into the plasma. So you can actually mm. um, have kind of delayed sedation if you continue to use that drug, for example, as a PCA. But, mm. you know, these are, we're talking massive, massive doses over significantly large periods of time to really be dangerous. But it's a pharmacokinetic mm -hmm. principle I think it's important to be aware of. Yeah, and again, I think I, I, I'm, just, I'm just not seeing every, any evidence. It's very theoretical. I haven't seen when this actually occurs. Uh, if anyone knows about it, please email us at anesthesiapodcast at gmail.com. Let us know if there's any good evidence about how much it takes to saturate tissues. Mm. Look, that's probably fentanyl done. Now, mm. might as well sidestep to IV oxycodone. We don't use it in our, in, in our center, but uh, it's, you know, it's pretty readily available these days and not too expensive. Um, again, it's, to me, it's, it's, it's like a... It's like morphine really, you know, I dose it roughly 0.1 milligrams per kilogram. It's got a similar profile. It's onsets probably in the same time frame of, you know, 15 minutes peak, but you know, you see effects pretty quickly. And it, you know, it's one of those things that's probably more expensive because it's a newer drug, but it, it may have some active metabolites, but it's not as well known as having problems with that. Um, I think the worst part about oxycodone in general is the addictive potential of it. I think it's, the opioid crisis is in large part due to the ease of uh, ease of access of endones and endone derivative drugs. Uh, but otherwise, the IV formula, I, I really just, as a simple tool, as a simple rule, sorry, I just use it like I'd use morphine. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I've used it at a few a couple of centers I've rotated through, and I, I think it's a it's a great drug in the perioperative setting. Mm -hmm. um, it's as you said, has all the benefits of I think both agents um, and the only adverse effect really being the um, the addictive potential. Um, there is an active metabolite, which is um, from memory was uh, it, it something like nor noroxycodone. That's usually the, yeah. <laughs> so you get, you get uh, active oxymorphone, I think. And it was, and oh, yeah. oxy, I think it doesn't matter. No oxycodone is inactive, but it, it's irrelevant. So it's not really a huge consideration unless you have really severe hepatic failure. Um, oh, sorry, uh, so renal failure, but not, not really practical. But I think um, it, it's very useful intraoperatively. As you said, you dose it as um, you would give morphine. And again, it, it's then really quite handy for conversion to, um, you know, oral more uh, oxycodone equivalents because it's a drug that so many junior staff mm -hmm. in the wards are familiar with compared yep. with trying to titrate it to fentanyl or morphine, which can be a bit tricky if you're yeah. familiar. Actually, a, a, quick, a quick rule, um, just so that, you know, there's far more to go into this, obviously, but a quick rule, if you've got IV oxycodone, the rough equivalent dose of IV oxycodone is twice that. So two to one, you'd roughly give, you know, twice the amount of oral oxycodone. Morphine, however, is three to one. So the bioavailability is roughly, you know, 30% for morphine and maybe up to you know 50% of oxycodone. I'm pretty sure I'm correct with that. It's a long time since I've looked at the kind of dose conversion tables, but that's just a rough guide. It sounds correct, yeah. Yeah, let's go with that. Um, okay, good. good. So again, just simple rules, get you started making decisions about what you want. And that's one of those important things. You get into your anesthetic rotation, you start asking for particular agents for your patients and knowing what to watch out for. So let's go to some of the specialized drugs now. So remifentanil and alfentanil. Let's start with alfentanil. Uh, so onset, pretty quick, you know, it's very far, you know, high, sorry, very low PK. So 30 second, up to 60 yeah. second onset. It probably lasts about 10 minutes. You've got a very fast clearance um, and it's a super effective medication as well, just like all your other opioids. Um, what, yeah, so when, um, and dosing about 10 to 20 micrograms per kilogram. So roughly a vial is a thousand mics. If I just want a bit of, you know, laryng, you know, ablation to the sympathetic response to laryngoscopy, I give it a thousand, you know, anywhere from 500 to a thousand, depending on the age of the patient. But if I really, really want to, ablate this response, I might even give 1,500 to 2,000 micrograms of alfentanil. And that's probably on the higher end. And definitely, as with everything, talk to your consultant, consider your patient, all the usual disclaimers. Uh, what do you, yeah, what, what do you use it for, Kaz? And what, uh, you know, what are the special features? And what do you watch out for? So alfentanil's, um, I guess, mainstay is really in induction, um, particularly rapid sequence induction. 
So um, as we spoke about in the last episode, the, the purpose of an RSI is to attain intubating conditions really quickly and alpha fentanyl works very quickly as Lars said within 30 seconds. Um, it's got a, um, quite, a, quite a profound um, effect and can be very effective at blunting the, the uh, autonomic response to, um, to intubation. The, the other use case where I've, I've seen it and found it quite useful is in sedation cases. Um, so mm. if you're doing sedation um, for local injection, um, it's it's phenomenal. You, you know, it's quite uh, propofol sparing. And, um, I, you know, I did a case yesterday where I had the patient awake who was, you know, felt said he felt a bit drunk. So he was obviously a bit affected, but um, he was awake and, and appropriate and he couldn't feel the, the local going into his, you know, infected mm. Um, oh man, and it was just quite a quite an interesting moment where you kind of go. It's actually just such an effective anti um, so yeah. analgesic, I should say. That's great. And when you think um, about it, you really want you know the, the injection of local into your skin hurts, but then after it's injected and that injection lasts a couple of seconds, you don't need any extra analgesia after that because the local anesthetic for that you know, skin lesion excision or whatever it is is now working. And so really, you want something fast onset, fast offset. That's it. I always use fentanyl. It's just what I'm used to. It's probably a bit more forgiving, less apneas with that. But alfentanyl, absolutely fantastic drug for you know any kind of short term things like skin lesion excisions and local anesthetic infiltration. Mm, yeah, exactly. Um, um, and even for for gastroscopies and things, I think it's for you know for, yeah. with, with with some of the scopes, there's a couple of points where it's really stimulating, and then the rest of it's relatively comfortable. So if if you just want to get analogies for that particular point and not have the complications with apneas and things fantastic about drugs so those are probably my main use cases is there any other situation you'd use it for here? yeah um you know sometimes intraoperatively you know maybe i'm you know it's a longer case maybe i'm not sure how much analgesia on is is on board maybe i've given repeated doses of fentanyl and i'm not sure whether this tachycardia now is analgesic issues and pain or if it's something else i sometimes might use our fentanyl as a diagnostic tool is this pain? Is this tachycardia due to pain in my sleep patient because I can't ask them? And I might give alfentanil and just see what the response is. And so that's a very specific situation I might use it in. Um, I wouldn't say that's a common use. So, you know, maybe, maybe don't go for that first up. <laughs> that's probably just a me thing. But yeah, I, I think that's what I use it for. I quite like that. I had, I had, a, had a case yesterday when um, we had kind of, a, a, I'm assuming the patient had tonic pain because they had one limb, had, had a tonic and then straight after they had to get operation on the other limb. So that subsequent tourniquet is on for, you know, mm. like upwards of about four hours um, and just very hypertensive and tachycardic. And, you know, yeah. we gave a lot of an an analgesics and it wasn't really working. And we were both, both me and the consultant were sitting there going, it's probably tourniquet pain, yeah, but, but we don't really know. So I'll keep that up my ass. Now. <laughs> I mean, tourniquets are funny. Laparoscop laparoscopic surgery and tourniquets are funny because after a certain amount of time with tourniquets, you just get this hypertension tachycardia no matter what you do and yeah it's good to it's good to know that <laughs> and i'd say it's something you just have to accept a lot of the time unless they have a real problem with tachycardia that you need to treat in which case i might give a beta blocker but yeah so alfentanil fast acting really effective great for that short term analgesia and the things i do watch out for it is so bradycardiogenic so you you know with big doses please be careful you might get severe bradycardias I haven't seen any asystoles with it. Uh, and then because of the bradycardia hypotension, but there's a familiar pattern. Like a lot of the agents that we give are, will cause bradycardia, propofol, your fentanyls, you know, these are all bradycardiogenic. And so imagine that case where you're doing very common case, lap coli in a young person, uh, you know, the pneumoperitoneum insufflation with someone who's had our fentanyl and propofol, it's just this thing that's talked about a lot as having an increased risk for, you know, bradycardias on insufflation of pneumoperitoneum. Something you might see, just, just to be careful of it, I think we're all very cautious during laparoscopic surgery that, you know, the heart rate, you know, on insufflation is not somewhere like 50 because it can drop pretty quickly because, because of a number of reasons. And so just be really careful with these very effective opioids that they can cause severe bradycardias. Hmm. Okay, so let's get into remifentanil. Now, remifentanil is a, really peculiar medication. Um, it, again, it's a very effective opioid. It, it, it's really fast. It, it's a super fast onset, so 30, 30 second onset. Um, the interesting thing about remifentanil is, first of all, it comes as a powder, one, two, or even five milligrams. You need to reconstitute it. And usually you put it into a 50 mil syringe 
and it's, you know, it's concentrations anywhere from 10 to 20, 40, 50 mics per mil, depending on the concentration, and you run it as an infusion. Now, interestingly, it's metabolized by esterases, so plasma esterases, and because you have so many of these, it's, and it's independent of organs, so not liver or renally metabolized or excreted, it means that uh, you, know, you can run this theoretically for hours, days, weeks, months, if you'd ever had to do it, and you, you know, the half-life would still be very short. So it's rapidly metabolized. The T half is about four minutes, regardless of how long you run these infusions. And um, so it's, it's a very niche drug, very peculiar, and one of the most you know, effective opioids for some very specific situations. So I think we've gone through that. the onset, the dosing regime, so the onset and offset, the dosing regime. Uh, usually you, you run some kind of model where you might run, you know, usually for just sedation, 0 0.05 mics per kilo per minute. Uh, and then, you know, for more, for, for actual analogies of doing a case, 0.1 to 0.2 mics per kilo per minute. And you can also use effect site or plasma concentration models where you'd roughly want maybe one to two nanograms per mil as your target concentration for sedation. And anywhere from two to six nanograms per mil for effective analgesia uh, intraoperatively. Um, so that's, that's about the basics of it. Uh, when, would you, when would you use it, Kaz? Yeah, so Taruma Fentanyl is, I think, one of my favorite drugs, and I think it is for a lot of people. Um, its 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 main use case is is really when you want to uh, a have a very still patient, um, but not have them paralyzed. So this can be in instances where um, you are generally when you when the surgical um, team want to do neuromuscular monitoring, um, mm. or when they're dissecting near, for example, you know, parotidectomy, when they want to preserve the facial nerve or test the recurrent laryngeal nerve in a parotidectomy. Those are the yep. main use cases where you can keep the patient exquisitely still. And um, uh, one thing I remember experiencing, if they ever do ner uh, big free flaps and nerve transplant type cases, you know, those real big plastics, Jekyll and Hyde type, <laughs> sorry, mm. <laughs> big plastics, Frankenstein style, style cases. Yeah. Often they want to monitor the, the nerves and make sure you're not running paralysis as well. I'm sure many anesthetists have been caught out with that problem so yeah absolutely you don't want to give paralysis for nerve monitoring yeah keep going exactly. so so in those instances um you know you, you could give a short acting agent um like sucks um and then start remy to keep them still ongoing some uh surgeons when when some anesthetists sorry when they know the chronicity of the operation they're pretty happy giving something like a smaller dose of attract um given that it's quite reliable in its offset um, so there's a couple of ways to do it. Um, so or, I guess, or you can just yeah. give Remy fentanyl and not give relaxant at all for the intubation. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I've only done that once, um, mm. but it definitely needs a bit of a bit of a ephedrine chaser to get the heart rate back up. I find. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's quite interesting doing that. Mm. Um, and so the other, you know, exactly. If you if you've got these long case, if you've got these cases where you want to avoid paralysis, Remy fentanyl is fantastic. And I, and the other situation I thought I might find, you know, find myself in is often people might have had anaphylaxis and they're still awaiting muscle relax and testing. And that window is like six weeks uh, from the incident. So sometimes they might represent for an operation and you're not really sure which muscle relaxant you can give because if you're allergic to one, you may have an increased likelihood of having anaphylaxis to all the others. Some, some statistic like you're three times more likely to have anaphylaxis in general, let alone to other muscle relaxants. Uh, so you may want to just avoid them altogether if possible. And Remy fentanyl potentially allows you to do that. Um, as well as some patients might come in without all the information. Maybe they're allergic to, mm. are you muscle relaxed? And they're not sure which one you don't have any medical records. And this could be a way you can avoid doing that by just using a really effective opioid, uh, that prevents the, you know, the movement, uh, or muscle, muscle reactivity during the operation. Um, other times I've, I've, you know, obviously any patient with severe organ impairment, you could use this. Uh, and it wouldn't accumulate, but also really long cases. Like, I don't know if you've ever had those cases where it's going for a very long time. You, you want to extubate at the end, and it's hard to know where you're at with your opioids. If you keep dosing fentanyl and morphine, you're not really sure how much is effectively there at the end of the operation. Uh, and a one-hour operation, easy to decide. A 16-hour operation, is that 10 of morphine at the start? How much of it's still around? Is that 50 to 100 mics of fentanyl every half an hour to an hour? Is that how much is still working at the end? Whereas with Remy, yeah. you know, it all will go away in a very short period of time. And now you can give the appropriate amount of morphine at the end. So you might give the 10 of morphine, you know, titrated towards the end of the operation if you're running Remy for 16 hours. 
um, or, or fentanyl, whatever your choice is. Um, yeah. The other, the, the other situation is really awake fiber optics. Fantastic conditions can be gained. And there's many ways of doing awake fiber optic intubations, but running Remy really prevents that cough and patients often feel a lot more relaxed uh, when, you, when you're using it as well. That's, that's and, pretty and the, much. Um, yeah. the, the only other, yeah, so the only other use yeah. case um, really is Remy fentanyl PCAs in obstetrics. Ah, oh, that's um, right. Which I think I've only ever heard of being used in a few centers, but it's, um, it's you know, a recognized modality, which obviously gives a patient a lot of autonomy, which I think is, I, I think is really important in, uh, in obstetrics. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, they work quite, quite effectively. I haven't seen it being used in a surgical population much. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if you have the hero. No, I think they're not, they're not too worried about Remy fentanyl into, you know, going through the placenta to the fetus, uh, you know, in other cases, obviously. So yeah, that's why they probably wouldn't have it uh, in the surgical population and the increased monitoring requirements. And, mm. you know, it's so effective <laughs> that yeah. you really worry about all the side effects of opioids in general. You know, you're worrying about all the bradycardic effects and sedative effects and apneic effects. Mm. Exactly. So, 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 you go. Um, I guess just, just on that, you know, one of the things um, I, I always am really cognizant about, about is um, errors in dilution and errors in setting mm. up the pump because I think there's so much variability with a the 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 dilution of remifentanil. You know, you could put two grams into thirty three mils, two grams into forty, two grams into fifty, um, and there's various ways of setting up the pump. So you can run it mic- micrograms per kilo per minute. You can run it as a Minto model. Um, there's several variations in there, which I, I don't really think it's um, we need to go into today. But um, there, there's you know inevitably inevitably there's a a few cases you know, in Victoria every year when um, a, a wrong dilution has been given or a wrong pump has been, um, a pump setting has been used um, or even, you know, mixing up the propofol and the Remy TCI models. You know, th- these are errors that happen in the middle of the night when you're fatigued. Mm. Um, so, so I would always be very careful and I've just made a habit of always checking. And if I'm not sure what the dilution of something is, I throw it away and I drop a new one that, you know, yeah. $20 is irrelevant in this grand scheme of things that is a really good suggestion and especially when you're looking at such big numbers and unfamiliar maths so you know it's, it's one of those rules that if you're doing a dilution something you don't do commonly or you think it's you know the maths on it may be slightly difficult or unfamiliar you do you do the, you work it out yourself you get someone to independently work it out and you both compare your answers uh, just to make sure that your concentrations are okay just remember that that doesn't mean saying Hey, um, I've you know put two thousand micrograms into fifty mils. I think it's forty mics per mil because that you, that way you're priming the next person to you know, agree with you because they don't want to disagree. Uh, make sure that they work out the solution uh, independent of you. That that's also the case with insulin. You know, it's hundred units per mil in a three mil vial. It's a very odd kind of system, Bizarre. and you, you know you you don't want to give fifty to hundred units in, incorrectly. You definitely want to make sure that that's uh, that's correctly done. Hmm. Um, so and, and you should you should never be afraid of checking. You know, I, I came back from four weeks of leave, and every yeah. every drug, not every drug, but everything that was dangerous that I diluted, I just double checked with the consultant, and I said, "I've been away for three weeks. I'm a bit rusty." And no one, I think, has ever looked at me strangely yeah. for asking them to do that with yeah. Remy and Lycopene <laughs> and drugs like that. It's just being humble about the fact that you know <laughs> we, we're all going to make mistakes, and checking, double checking is very useful. Hey, so what would you watch out for with Remy fentanyl? Yeah, look, so, so with Remy, um, you've touched on a few of these already last. So, so bradycardia can be quite mm-hmm. profound. Um, if you're running it as an infusion, um, if you do have to use higher doses, you can get quite significant bradycardia. So it's about having a plan in place um, to counteract that. So a common thing I find is using aramine and Remy fentanyl intraoperatively can actually give, if, if the patient becomes unstable, can worsen your bradycardia. So having some plans for that. Um, and, and really the other common thing is, um, you know, apnea as if you're doing it for awake fiber optic, but also really the hyperalgesia. Um, and this is, this is quite, a, quite a debated topic I found out when I was studying for the primary exam. So um, th- there's a couple of proposed mechanisms. Some people think it's directly because of, the, because of the opiate receptor. Some people think it's because of a metabolite that acts on a toll-like receptor. And there's a group of anesthetists who actually think it's because when you run Remy, you don't give any other analgesia. So the patient wakes up sore. So it's not a hyperalgesia, it's an underalgesia. Mm-hmm. Um, and I haven't really looked into, you know, corroborating mm. any of that. But I think um, being aware that 
um, if you are using the remifentanil to, to give a longer acting agent. So that counteracts point number three. And then in other states to give um, you know, drugs that are very effective against preventing central sensitization. So ketamine, buprenorphine, clonidine um, are quite effective, but I've seen quite a variability in, hmm. um, in whether you run those adjuncts or not. I don't know what your thoughts are with this, Lahiri. Yeah, look, I, I don't have too strong feelings about it. I think it's a just relatively unknown area. Uh, so what, watch the space, have a cautious approach. But I think the one thing that is true is exactly what you said. There's no other opioid that I've had such interesting experiences with and the side effects are profound. So, you know, the bradycardias are faster and more profound. The hypertension occurs more rapidly and more profoundly. Uh, the apneas occur quicker. It's, it's just such a fast-acting, effective opioid, uh, and it's prone to errors as well. So there's many reasons why you want to be really careful when running Remy. And you know, as a junior, you'd be so careful about giving any kind of bolusing. So running infusions, pretty safe. Make sure it's the right infusion. Uh, but if you're, if you're giving a bolus, be very, very careful. Uh, and you know, one of those things to mitigate against those problems is to have ephedrine rather than aramine on hand for blood pressure problems. Uh, even giving a dose of glycopyrrolate, which is a you know anticholinergic agent uh, at 0.2 to 0.4 milligrams, just you know for the awake fiber optic, it's great because it's an anti sialogog as well, stops all the mm. mucus production or pre decreases that, uh, but also stops the profound bradycardias or hopefully prevents it. So yeah, just be really careful when running Remy fentanyl because everything is far more quick and profound. <laughs> all the side effects. That's good. I think we've pretty much covered all our agents. So, you know, we've gone through a good summary of morphine, fentanyl, IV oxycodone, alfentanyl, and remifentanyl. Hopefully there's a practical guide to why you'd use one and what you need to look out for. And hopefully, you know, it really helps you on your first rotation in anesthesia. So yeah, thanks very much for listening. Please share with anyone who might be interested and there's ABCs of anesthesia. See you next time. Bye.